lectures on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States, hosted by Princeton University's Keller Center. We started this series in the summer, in the spring of 2021, and are thrilled to be continuing it. I'm excited to tell you that this series about the series and introduce you to our amazing speaker, Dr. Nicholas Gaffney. My name is Isam Beezer, and I'm a university administrative fellow hosted by the Keller Center and a PhD candidate at Rutgers Business School, where I study entrepreneurship from both contemporary and historical perspectives. The center's mission is to arm our community with the intellectual foundation, innovation skills, and networks to propel positive and sustainable um, societal impact. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and systemic racial inequality inequity in our country and how this has deep how this is deeply linked to so many of our country's most profound challenges. We understand how important it is for our community has, that we have an understanding of these systemic in inequities as we work towards solving some of humanity's most pressing challenges. Which brings me, which brings me to today's um, this today's lecture. Sorry, for all for all interested in innovation entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurs who have succeeded under some of the most daunting constraints. For at the end of the day, this is what entrepreneurship is all about: assembling limited resources for impact. Um, black innovators and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, and even threats of violence and death. Uh, there's also been theft of intellectual property, intellectual capital, and many other extreme challenges, yet still they thrive. These entrepreneurs have created innovations which have resulted in lasting societal and cultural changes far beyond the Black community. By exploring the history of Black entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the creative strategies Black entrepreneurs employ to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints on Black entrepreneurship and business development has limited overall economic, the overall economics of not only Black communities, but our society as a whole, and how, many, and how so many of these constraints, constraints have been institutionalized and how this can be overcome in the future. This exciting series of talks brings together scholars and academics from numerous institutions from around the country to share their scholarship in a discussion-based forum. But before we begin, I want to remind everyone that during the talk, please put your questions and comments in the Q&A box. All right. So at the end of the day, at the end, uh, Dr. Gaffney will address your questions and comments. So we have our very own um, Keller Center uh, visiting scholar, visiting, visiting professor, Dr. Keith Hollingsworth, to give our, our scholar a proper and well-deserved introduction. So thank you, Dr. Hollingsworth. Thank you, Isan. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Gaffney to you today because uh, Dr. Gaffney is a former student of mine. Uh, given how young I am, that makes him practically an infant. So yes, I have taught him and I've known him for many years and he's a close friend. Uh, Dr. Gaffney is the director of the Center of African American Studies at the University of South Carolina Upstate and an assistant professor of history there. <clears throat> Prior to joining USC Upstate, he was an associate dean for Humanities and Social Sciences at the Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, his degrees are from Morehouse College in English, an Ohio State Master's in African and African American Studies, and then a PhD in History from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. His research agenda focuses on the history of African American socio-political movements in the 20th century. Particularly, he's been looking at jazz studies for as long as I've known him. I'm also thrilled to announce that this fall, uh, Dr. Gaffney will be started a new position at the United States Naval Academy. So we're very proud of him on that. So Dr. Gaffney, I'm gonna let you take it away and we're so happy to have you here with us today. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. And it, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with the Keller Center uh, for such an amazing and phenomenal lecture series. I just feel honored to be a part of it. So I just wanna say thanks to everyone, uh, the staff and faculty that support the center uh, for kind of creating this and just giving me the opportunity to come and share some of my work. Indeed, as Dr. Hollingsworth shared, a lot of my research focuses on the relationship between uh, kind of jazz and social movements, and the work I'm going to present today kind of comes out of that. But I want us to think about Dizzy Gillespie, not Dizzy Gillespie the musician, but Dizzy Gillespie the entrepreneur, right? Dizzy Gillespie the businessman, right? The small business owner. In many ways, this conversation today is a way to help us think about the ways in which 
African-American entrepreneurs like Dizzy Gillespie as a small business owner, right, producing jazz music, uh, and the influence that entrepreneurs have in other aspects and avenues of American life, in this particular case, the civil rights movement. So today I'm presenting a, my talk uh, looking at the 1963-1964 Gillespie for President movement and the entrepreneurial influence on civil rights ideology. The readers of Downbeat Magazine, one of the nation's leading jazz trade publications, may have been surprised when they saw the cover of the November 5th, 1964 issue, which we're looking at right now, a remarkable departure from the typical cover displaying musicians and their instruments, the November 5th issue presented the image of John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie wearing a tuxedo and top hat, being sworn in as a 37th president of the United States of America. The caption of this one-of-a-kind cover read, Dizzy's Dream Inauguration Day, 1965. The cover picture suggested that Gillespie's dream went far beyond becoming the first African-American elected to the American presidency. With the American flag flying above his head, the trumpeter was being sworn in by a black chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States with another black justice standing at his left side. The audience assembled to witness and celebrate this historical moment was comprised of white Americans. A young white man wearing a Gillespie campaign sweatshirt with Disney's likeness on it printed on the back, and a young white woman patriotically holding a miniature American flag stood attentively at the front of the crowd. The image of Dizzy's dream that Downbeat presented to its readership conjured the notion of a white American citizenry subject to the constitutional authority of a black controlled state. The cover story for Downbeat's November 5th, 1964 issue was titled, Dizzy Gillespie for President. And in a meet the press styled format, the magazine promised to offer readers insight into Gillespie's platform, his likely cabinet appointments, and his views on Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater, his Democrat and Republican opponents. Downbeat's cover image and story provided its readership a detailed look into the Gillespie for President movement where Dizzy Gillespie campaigned for the presidency of the United States of America in the 1964 general election. Gillespie's run for the presidency was driven less by a genuine interest in capturing the Oval Office and was more significantly motivated by a desire to use the power and influence of the celebrity to push the envelope of the 1963-1964 election season's political discourse surrounding freedom for people of color in the United States and abroad. In lieu of standing on the political sidelines, watching to see how the prospects for securing civil and human rights for people of color would fare under a state guided by Barry Goldwater's traditional morality or Lyndon Johnson's great society, the Gillespie campaign injected the election's political discourse with a radical third alternative, black co-optation of the state. So this talk is about the Gillespie for President movement and again, we're talking about a faux campaign for the presidency that Dizzy Gillespie ran in 1963, 1964, uh, where he used his celebrity as a broad-based communication platform to communicate with people within the jazz world about the prospects for African-American civil and human rights and for people of color abroad. And the whole goal behind this campaign was to keep civil rights in the election's political discourse. And again, there was a lot of concern in 1963, 1964, with the civil rights bill that Kennedy had called before his assassination being stalled from the Congress about what the outcome of, of civil rights would be from the standpoint of the federal government. So in order to keep the election season actively engaged, right, the political discourse engaged with civil rights issues, Gillespie launches this campaign and plays the role of a candidate during performances and interviews. And his sole focus in this context is to talk about the importance of economic and political self-determination for people of color. In many ways, this is where uh, Gillespie's kind of business acumen comes in, in terms of shaping and influencing his ideas. We'll talk more about that in the presentation. And we're just looking at a, a bumper sticker that was produced uh, by Gillespie's uh, publicity company, uh, the Associated Booking Corporation, who produced a lot of campaign paraphernalia as Gillespie began to organize and launch this campaign for the presidency. 
And within this context, it's important to recognize that on the ideological spectrum uh, or civil rights activism over the course of this period, that Dizzy Gillespie had a vision for racial integration. Uh, the core values of seeing an integrated society where African Americans, white Americans, Americans of all colors and creeds working together uh, really shaped Gillespie's worldview. When you see that over the course of this campaign, over this time period, uh, and you see this reflected in a letter that Dizzy Gillespie sends to Duke Ellington uh, on the effort to open a performing arts center in Harlem. And in this letter, he writes to Duke Ellington talking about the, the significance of the work that might be taking place in this performing arts center in Harlem. Gillespie writes, I'd like to help them give a sense of cultural identity. As Negroes, this isn't a matter of black nationalism. It's a preliminary step towards the assimilation and integration that has to come. He goes on to say that besides seeing successful Negroes, you want the kids to see Negroes and whites working together. So over the course of this campaign, Gillespie is going to embody this integrationist ethos and this integrationist perspective. And that's important to recognize because when you look at the history of what we could call the Black freedom struggle, uh, kind of writ large in the post-World War II moment, the 1963 to 1965 is a really important moment of ideological transition. You're beginning to see the emergence of kind of black Marxist perspectives being introduced. You're beginning to see the emergence of, of and rising tide of black nationalism. So there's some very serious and sharp ideological debates taking place in this moment in time. But, but Gillespie, through this campaign, is committed to a vision of racial integration. And his background as an entrepreneur and individual has primed him for involvement within the civil rights movement. It's been a part of who he is in his development over the course of his uh, you know, coming of age as a young man and his career trajectory as an entrepreneur and a musician. Now, Gillespie himself uh, is a native of Sherrod, South Carolina and grew up in the segregated South. Uh, he was familiar with the sharecropping dynamics and the exploitation economically that African-Americans suffered uh, in that sharecropping arrangement. Uh, in the rural South, uh, as a young man, his family was involved in sharecropping, and he had the experience of uh, kind of picking and cultivating cotton, uh, you know, for a, not a fantastic price. He was also affected pretty dramatically uh, by the climate of racial violence within the South. As a young uh, child, he uh, helped organize a band uh, with some of his uh, fellow students in his school, and one of his band members, a trombonist named Bill McNeil, uh, ended up being lynched and murdered. Uh, and that was an episode that shaped his perspective pretty dramatically as he would develop uh, and kind of come of age and kind of grow into a musician and an entrepreneur. Reflecting back on the experience in his autobiography, Gillespie wrote, they tell you that you are colored and all that, but I never consider myself inferior to white people. No one can make me feel inferior. I would always fight. And that was the perspective that Gillespie carried with him and he brought to the civil rights movement and civil rights activism in the post-World War II moment really began to take off. And Gillespie was involved in those efforts. He actively contributed uh, to civil rights movement fundraising initiatives in the early 1960s, uh, performed for numerous, um, numerous benefit concerts, uh, famous concerts held by people like Jackie Robinson on the front lawn of his Connecticut home. Uh, Gillespie would play uh, for those benefits, uh, kind of donating its services free of charge. Uh, when the Congress for Racial Equality uh, called for musicians to participate in a, in a recording they were producing called a Jazz Salute to Freedom as a fundraising mechanism, uh, Gillespie gladly contributed uh, his kind of royalties uh, in line for performing on that album. So he's someone that had been actively involved within the civil rights movement kind of up to the 1963-1964 moment when his campaign launches. Uh, but he's also affected by the changes that are taking place in the movement at that particular moment in time. And one of the things that's, that's shaping the larger climb of the civil rights movement in the 1963 to 1965 period in which this campaign falls is a growing perspective that what we can call civil, civil rights liberalism uh, was starting to fail, right, was starting to collapse. And if you look at the civil rights movement that begins uh, in the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education, through the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, to the student sit in movement, uh, to the Freedom Rides, and the SCLC can SCLC's campaigns in places like Albany, Georgia, and Birmingham, Alabama, they'd all been largely guided by a belief in civil rights and liberalism. 
the idea that African American, white American activists could work together uh, to come up with a set of concerns, they could appeal to elected officials and work with elected officials to introduce legislative reforms at the local, state, and federal level that would protect African Americans' rights that were guaranteed within the U.S. Constitution. In a nutshell, that begins to define the core strategy uh, that civil rights activists had pursued. But when you get to the 1963-1964 moment, you're beginning to see civil rights activists becoming somewhat disaffected and disillusioned with that strategy, right? A belief that that strategy may not be effective. You know, one of those things that triggers that belief uh, in the fact that maybe civil rights liberalism is not working uh, was the stall, the stalling of the civil rights bill of 1963 that Kennedy had called for in the, in the filibuster against that legislation that took place within the Congress. Uh, the failure of the uh, of two years uh, of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Activism uh, that took place in Mississippi, uh, that led to the creation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, uh, and the effort to take that party to the 1964 uh, nominating convention for the Democratic Party in Atlantic City, and the failure of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to be seated at that convention was a sign that maybe its civil rights liberalism was not working, they felt portrayed by, by Lyndon Johnson. Uh, the belief on the local level, right? Matthew Countryman, a fantastic historian uh, in a book called Up South, uh, talks about the experiences of local African-American activists in Philadelphia, right? Trying to pursue uh, access to employment opportunities within the city using civil, life, civil rights liberalism, but kind of recognizing that was not working. Uh, and then the climate of racial violence that began to shape the movement that particularly affected Dizzy Gillespie, right? The failure of the federal government uh, to protect civil rights activists while they're engaged in protests. The assassination of Medgar Evers uh, was a particular trigger for Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church helped contribute to Gillespie's sense that maybe civil rights liberalism was not an approach that was going to be effective in helping to usher in the types of reforms that African Americans would need to secure and experience their civil rights. A lot of history uh, that's written about this transitional moment uh, that's written about the growing disillusion with civil rights liberalism, talks about civil rights activists at both the national level and the local level beginning to pivot to Black nationalism as an alternative, right? Kind of shifting away from reaching out to elected officials, to work with elected officials to usher in reforms uh, that would produce policies that would protect African Americans' rights. They're shifting towards internal community building, right? Kind of building independent, autonomous Black institutions politically, economically, to advance African-Americans' experiences within the United States. Diz Gillespie uh, disaffected with that same sense of the failure of civil, right, civil rights liberalism is going to pivot in an interesting and different direction. He's going to pivot to what I've called radical integrationism. As opposed to trying to abandon civil rights liberalism altogether, his idea, and this is reflected in that cover image uh, of Downbeat Magazine that we be began to look at, his perspective was to co-op the state itself. If elected officials in that civil rights liberalism context would not, were not bearing out to be the partners that African-American activists needed, his goal was to become those partners. Right? His idea was to co-op the state by becoming president of the United States uh, and controlling the executive branch, by seeing Black justices sitting on the Supreme Court, controlling the judiciary on the federal level, you'd find African Americans in control of federal policymaking. With that control in place, the federal government would be able to introduce policies that would promote uh, economic and political self-determination for people of color within the United States and abroad. And it's important to also recognize that Gillespie in this context is not just focused on what's happening domestically, He's also focused on what's happening internationally as well, right? He's focused on a, on a focus on civil rights and human rights, right? Looking at this as a global dynamic, really focusing on people of color around the world. The other kind of key thing uh, that, that Gillespie uses to help make these ideas that are going to be radical, we'll talk about them, uh, to make them digestible is his use of humor, right? To begin to kind of circulate some of these pretty radical ideas. One of his uh, kind of signature can campaign pledges was to transform and kind of rename the White House to the Blues House, right, uh, to show that the, the federal government would be very kind of empathetic, right, to the needs of the people, right, but that kind of highlights how that humor operated within his campaign.
But it's also important to recognize that the ideas uh, that are going to show up in Gillespie's policy platform are ideas that aren't just being influenced by his role as a musician. And again, you know, we, we know Gillespie as a fantastic musician, as a founding pioneer of modern jazz. If you read anything about Dizzy Gillespie uh, in any jazz history book, that's always the, the focus of the discussion, right? His role as a modern jazz innovator, helping to create bebop alongside musicians like Charlie Parker, Max Roach, uh, Charles Mingus, uh, Thelonious Monk. We should also recognize that Dizzy Gillespie is an entrepreneur as well. He's a small business person, right? And we see this reflected in his career trajectory. Uh, he organizes his first small business, right, in the form of his first jazz orchestra in 1945. Um, he organized a, an, or an orchestra to play modern jazz music and to tour the South uh, to, quote, make some money, as he describes in his, uh, his uh, autobiography. So there's kind of this capitalist ethic, right, at the center of Gillespie's uh, work. With a $500 investment, he begins to organize the band, uh, begins to pay for practices, begins to pay for... Uh, transportation uh, for band members. And very cleverly, uh, they decide to draft a bunch of new arrangements and new songs for the tour to avoid having to pay royalties on music they had, that his group had previously recorded uh, for recording labels. He organizes a second small business, a second band in 1946, uh, this time serving as the house band of a place called The Spotlight, uh, major jazz club on 52nd Street uh, in New York City, kind of a famous, if you will, geography uh, for the birth of modern jazz. And he ends up performing uh, as the house band uh, for an African-American entrepreneur named Clark Monroe, who owned the spotlight. And so we see this interesting, interesting kind of reinforcement of African-American entrepreneurship within the jazz world. He goes on to co-found uh, DG Records in 1951. Uh, in describing the founding of DG Records, uh, he talks about the objective of building a large record company. I invested my money and talent and tried to become a music industrialist, right? So he's a musician, but he's got this business focus and this business, business ethic, right? That is driving what he does within the jazz world. He founds DG Records in uh, 1951 with a friend of his, a uh, white American named Dave Usher. And together they record uh, some pretty significant albums uh, within jazz history between 1951 and 1953 when the label shuts down. Uh, there are some kind of issues with uh, tax <laughs> kind of payment uh, and some of the uh, the masters, uh, master recordings uh, that the label held uh, were seized and, and kind of resold. Uh, so it also shows Gillespie kind of going through the, the experience of the ups and downs, right, of kind of uh, writing an entrepreneurial endeavor. But 1956, he begins to reorganize another small business uh, kind of rebuilds an orchestra. And this time he's got a contract by the federal government uh, in the famous Jazz Ambassador Tours uh, that took place beginning in 1956 that uh, go into the 1960s and talk about the way or highlight the way in which the federal government began to use jazz as a weapon, right, within the, within the Cold War against the Soviet Union, helping to kind of export the very best of American culture. And Gillespie's band was chosen and chosen first, right, to be the first band to tour, in this particular case, the Middle East, because his band was racially integrated, right? Gillespie, uh, as an African-American entrepreneur and business owner, had white Americans playing in the band with him, uh, kind of under him, uh, as well as women. So it was a diverse ensemble led by an African-American man that could help counter some of the perspectives on racial discrimination that the Soviet Union was propagandizing against the United States abroad. So we see Gillespie having the chance to travel internationally. And in many ways, this helps give Gillespie this global focus that will work its way into his policy perspectives as he begins to talk about the ideas that shape and inform his campaign platform uh, for his presidency. So in many ways, Gillespie is a fantastic musician, but he has his credentials as an entrepreneur as well. And it's that entrepreneurial uh, perspective, vision, that really seems to animate a large part of his campaign platform, right? And in an interview, in that, that cover story, right, uh, on that Downbeat Magazine uh, issue from 1964, November 5th, Gillespie begins that entire discussion uh, with the statement that economics is key to the whole thing, right? Economics is key to the whole thing. In many ways, we're going to find a very ec heavily economic influenced policy perspective that directly grows out of Gillespie's experience as an entrepreneur. And that interview goes on to say, and that the system of discrimination started during slavery time. It's an economic thing. 
Of course, we don't have that slave system at the moment, but we do have something in its place, such as discrimination against people economically. So Gillespie also kind of recognized there's something unique, right, about the American kind of economic system, this idea of racial capitalism uh, that uh, activists are talking about at this moment in time in terms of challenging the nature of U.S. capitalism. Uh, Gillespie's goal is not to eradicate capitalism, but it's a, a trying, a, trying to find a way to transform it, to create opportunities for African Americans through policy uh, that will allow them to reach their economic success and ultimately achieve economic self-determination. So he has this economic focus, right, to his campaign platform that becomes really key. And you see this reflected in some of his core ideas. The idea that within the federal policies that Gillespie wants to create, the idea of a race-blind hiring system, right, to ensure that African Americans get a fair shake for access to employment. And again, this is one of the key issues that civil rights activists are fighting for uh, across the country. Uh, you see groups like the Congress for Racial Equality kind of holding uh, demonstrations uh, in major retailers. Uh, there's a the Seattle chapter of the Congress for Racial Equality, for example, uh, is holding a like a shop in in Safeway grocery stores, trying to make sure that African Americans get access to working as clerks uh, in those stores. Uh, protests against banks, if you will, protests against uh, department stores, trying to open up access for African Americans to get opportunities for employment. And you see this reflected, right? A federal policy that would help to, to drive that forward and help to eradicate those discriminatory policies that would block African Americans from getting access to employment in Gillespie's campaign. Gillespie kind of shares that the National Labor Relations Board will rule that people applying for jobs will have to wear sheets over their heads so bosses won't know what they are until after they're hired, right? And Typing into his signature sense of humor, he says the sheets, of course, will all be colored. He's also an advocate uh, for the creation of Black cooperative businesses. Again, this shouldn't be read as, as a shift to socialism, but he's about the, he's really in favor of African Americans kind of pooling their resources together and opening up a business venture. In many ways, not too far afield from what he had done earlier in his career in terms of building these orchestras and working to organize a recording label. Uh, Gillespie shared that I'm um, for people pooling their money and buying something. I'm um, for all that because if they're not getting a fair shake, they're not getting a fair shake with white ownership, I think it's more, no more than right that they should have it themselves. So he's recognizing that if, these, if this kind of civilized liberalism, right, is not really working, if it's not opening up the opportunities that they hoped it would, they needed to shift to something else and working to build their own entrepreneurial endeavor would be that alternative. And he would open up policies to work to make that a possibility. Gillespie was also in favor of income, income tax reform. This is a really interesting kind of uh, aspect and kind of plank to his campaign platform that you see in other aspects and other areas of American political life, uh, the idea of abolishing the, the federal income tax altogether. Now, he recognizes that, that there is a great disparity, right, in the way the tax system is structured and that there are certain individuals and groups within society that have a significant advantage uh, in their taxation rate compared to others. And he recognizes the need to eliminate that. He kind of shares that there are certain elements of our society that have better breaks on the income tax than others. So his idea is to eliminate the federal income tax and replace it, kind of bringing in the humor with the numbers game. All right, that kind of unofficial uh, kind of lottery system that took place within African American communities uh, where people would, uh, I guess, designate a, a number like a lottery number be, that would be held by a, a bookkeeper. And if their number hit, they got the payout. He would kind of nationalize that to create something like the national lottery system that we have today, right? Not unlike the kind of Powerball or Mega Millions uh, jackpots that are kind of growing into the multi-million dollars as we speak. Uh, also in favor of federal funding for anti-poverty programs. In a part of the interview, they got into a big discussion about campaign finance, uh, and the idea that when you look at the, the 64 election, you know, some of the largest sums of money that have been spent uh, to date in the presidential campaigns have been spent in that election cycle. Uh, Gillespie talked about taking that money and, and allocating that out to, to ordinary working people, kind of recognizing that, you know, $7 to ordinary working man uh, will go a lot further than $10,000 to someone who was wealthy, right? The fact that uh, resources should be allocated on, on a needs base. And that means to highlight that dynamic. 
And the other thing that really spoke to musicians uh, in line with his economic perspective were federal regulation of jukeboxes, right? The idea of trying to protect the, the value of the intellectual property of musicians. Uh, there's a really interesting protest, and I'm, maybe I'll come back to this towards the end if there's time. Uh, there's a situation where the American Federation of Musicians are actually launching boycotts against the, the Johnson campaign because at campaign events, the Johnson campaign, as a way to save money, they're using jukeboxes as opposed to live bands to provide entertainment. And jukeboxes are playing recorded music by musicians, but musicians don't get royalty payments. There's actually legislation in Congress at this moment in time to address that. So Gillespie assuring that he would push that forward to make sure that musicians as business people, as workers, right, would be compensated uh, for the value of the products that they were creating and offering to the world. That economic perspective, right, and Gillespie's interest in, in foreign markets is going to also shape his perspective on foreign policy and really ties into the idea of opening up avenues for self-determination for people in other parts of the world, for people of color in other parts of the world. He is very much in favor of recognizing communist China. Again, when you look at foreign U.S. foreign policy in this moment in time, uh, we don't recognize China. There's no diplomatic recognition of China uh, as a communist state. In response to that, Gillespie says, can you imagine us thinking that 700 million people are no people? How much percent is that of the world's population? I think we should recognize them. Then he goes on to say, get some motive about why that might be, again, bringing that entrepreneurial perspective. Besides, we need the business. We're about to run out of markets, you know? Now, all of a sudden, you wake up, there's 700 million more people to sell something to. And then Gillespie's perspective was really driven by his idea uh, as an entrepreneur looking to sell records, right? This might be a population where you could, a new market to begin to penetrate to sell jazz records, a new market to penetrate uh, for performance tours. So in China, in the recognition of China, Gillespie saw an immense opportunity, right, uh, for entrepreneurial success, uh, for building wealth. He is also in favor of establishing relations with post-revolutionary Cuba. He goes on to say that I think any government has the privilege of nationalizing their wealth. Uh, in that conversation about the dipl diplomatic recognition of Cuba, Gillespie recognized, acknowledged that Castro had made uh, kind of inroads to providing some type of reparation to U.S. For US firms. You had the resources confiscated as a consequence of the, the revolution within Cuba, the nationalization of, of Cuba's wealth. He says, I am a man to respect, to respect a country, Cuba, regardless of their political affiliation. They are there, and there's no doubt about it. So this perspective, right, on economic self-determination that he's not only focused on at home, he also focuses on with respect to people of color abroad. And Gillespie, in this effort, right, to begin to open up avenues uh, for people of color within the United States and abroad to begin to actualize a sense of economic and political self-determination, Gillespie is going to introduce some major policy initiatives. He's in favor of political self-governance uh, for majority Black communities. Kind of recognizes that in kind of sharing with Downby in that interview that all United States attorneys and judges in the South will be our people so we can get some redress. One man, one vote. That's our motto. That's an important aspect, right? When you look at the way circumstances are taking shape within the U.S. South, one of the big goals of the civil rights movement is just to get compliance, right, with federal law. The fact that on the state, on the municipal level, in the state level, you're going to find uh, entities kind of violating federal law. If African Americans are in charge of the federal judicial system in those places, they'd have authority uh, to make uh, officials on the state level and local level abide by laws that are on the books, uh, which would open up African Americans and their ability to actually experience the rights that they already have. Gillespie pledged to disband Cointelpro. Uh, Cointelpro, uh, short for counterintelligence program, had been organized by the FBI uh, to really surveil and to interfere, if you will, within civil rights organizing. Uh, this is the group that, you know, placing wiretaps on the phones of people like Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Malcolm X. So Gillespie pledged to disband that entity. Uh, he pledged to use the power of, of his executive authority to investigate everything under white sheets for un-American activities. 
again, making a reference uh, to demobilizing the Ku Klux Klan within the United States. In any, uh, I guess, a stroke of, uh, I guess, kind of justice, poetic justice, uh, Gillespie pledged to appoint uh, Governor Ross Burnett, uh, Arkansas Governor Ross Burnett, and Alabama Governor George Wallace, two ardent segregationists, uh, to posts in the Congo and Vietnam, uh, respectively, right? Two kind of Cold War hotspots. Uh, where the United States was actively interfering with the rights uh, of people of color. As we see Gillespie looking to transform the state, right, from a vehicle of oppression uh, to a vehicle of liberation. And he does this in the context of a political campaign, which talks about the genius of this strategy. And again, it's important to recognize that Gillespie is not the only musician that is politically engaged over the course of this period, right? You see a lot of people within the jazz world, musicians, uh, promoters, producers, record labels, uh, club owners, all becoming engaged and helping to advance the goals and objectives of the civil rights movement. But it's not always uh, as clear cut and as easy, right, uh, for musicians to do this work. You find aspects where the, the political voices of musicians have been suppressed, uh, their famous case, when you look at Abby Lincoln, who records an album in 1961 called we, uh, Straight Ahead, uh, that begins to articulate a sense of Pan-Africanism. Uh, when that album is reviewed within the page of, of Downbeat Magazine, the same magazine that is giving Gillespie the space to talk about his campaign, uh, that same magazine, uh, a reviewer, a jazz critic named Ira Gittler, uh, charges that Abby Lincoln is a professional Negro. And is just kind of taking on this kind of Pan-African stance as a way to sell albums. Uh, the backlash against Abby Lincoln is so strong that she ends up being blacklisted within the jazz world for about a period of nine years, doesn't record, is not able to pre perform, has a huge uh, kind of devastating impact on her economic viability uh, as a jazz musician. Uh, same thing with Nina Simone. After Nina Simone begins to record and perform uh, Mississippi Goddamn in 1964, we see her uh, kind of blackballed and blacklisted as well within the jazz world. And even musicians like Randy Weston, who in 1961 attempted to record an did record an album called Youth or Africa uh, with the Jorba for Free Africa. Uh, his the recording label, Riverside, they actually benched the project. It was recorded in 1961, but it's not going to be released until late 1964 after that stalled civil rights bill actually passed through Congress, which signals uh, that the landscape might have shifted around uh, kind of African-American or the consensus around African-American rights. So they published the album then. So he gets his voice suppressed in terms of making the statements that he wants to make within that album. Gillespie's kind of genius was to shift out of being perceived as, as a musician and he played the role of a candidate, right? And by playing the role of a presidential candidate, he shifts the expectations that his audience has regarding his behavior. And that allows him to say a lot of really interesting things about economic self-determination, about political self-determination, that other musicians were stalled, that they were kind of, their barriers were thrown up blocking them from having those conversations. And this allows Gillespie to politicize what I call an otherwise apolitical leisure space. And that's part of the value of the work that Gillespie is doing here. He's forcing people to engage with civil rights movement ideology and the goals of the movement in very unexpected places. Right? It's one thing to kind of turn on the national news in the evening when you're sitting down with your family and you know you're going to see on the news some issues about the civil rights movement. You know when you open up the, the kind of politics page of your newspaper, you're going to read about the civil rights movement. Uh, but if you're looking to just kind of kind of dive into the jazz world, kind of relax and kind of release from your work day, not really expecting to hear or get confronted with civil rights ideology, but Gillespie is making that happen through the context of using this campaign for the presidency. Or what uh, uh, social movement theorists have described as informing externally, right? Kind of taking the ideas of a social movement to audiences that are, aren't directly engaged within the scope of social movement activism. Gillespie is effective in doing that work within the jazz world. So I do just want to kind of shift gears and talk some about how this worked, right? Just to give you a sense of what this looks like as it begins to be implemented and how people are going to be engaged with Gillespie's vision and to understand that the significance of that, that engagement, right? Of Gillespie taking these ideas uh, into the jazz world. In order to understand that, uh, how people are reacting to his ideas, you really have to understand the nature of the jazz audience over the course of this period. And so it really begs the question of who was the civil rights era jazz fan? Who's listening to this music? 
And ironically, we don't know that much about uh, the civil rights, uh, the, the jazz fan over the course of this period. Jazz historiography uh, has just not done a fantastic job of sketching out who these individuals were. Uh, there's some broad assumptions, uh, upper income, college educated, uh, predominantly white, uh, ideological assumptions about this group, uh, notion that this might be a, a group of kind of liberal progressives because they're listening to a black music. Uh, but one of the things I've done to sort of try to understand this better is to analyze real letters that have been sent in and published by jazz magazines, which offer more insights into jazz fans perspectives. I just want to share some snippets of those with you. This one is from Al Fisher, uh, who sends a letter into uh, Metronome Magazine, January 61, published in the Reader's Forum. He goes on to say there are certain characteristics about jazz fans, uh, which are common to all who claim membership in the genre. Uh, modern jazz fans and a werecat, individualistic. I kind of quickly paraphrase here, the jazz fan further accepts nothing on its face, wants to hear for himself, and probably has more than the basic training than most of us goes on to say that now when I pick up a jazz magazine, this becomes important, right, for the work that Gillespie is doing and the value of this campaign. Now, when I pick up a jazz magazine, I do so because I want to immerse myself completely in the jazz world. This is my escape. I resent distractions. I don't want to read the scrawlings of some amateur press. I want jazz man and nothing else. Gillespie's campaign is going to interrupt, right, what Al Fisher is looking for, and I'm arguing that's significant, right? He is having to confront Al Fisher, he's going to have to confront these ideas about economic self-determination when he's trying to relax. And part of the importance of the civil rights movement was to make these ideas inescapable for Americans. You had to force people to confront these ideas in every aspect of American life. And again, the music is becoming politicized over the course of this period. Olaf Blackshire in the Reader's Forum in Metrodome in September 61, as far as protests and music is concerned, I happen to feel that it's just what happens. It happens to be the predominant uh, of many of the jazz world's top creators today. It's a necessary and vital part of the music. It goes on to say, if protest happens to be a feeling that is not welcome in many segments of society today, that's just too bad, right? Just the nature of the beast it helps to highlight the fact that ja the jazz world is becoming engaged with politics. But not everyone likes this, right? Uh, Frank for Polk, uh, writing in October 61 into Metrodome's uh, reader form. Today, Metrodome seems to cover everything else except music. It's too far out. It's too opinionated without giving background, without background to give it depth. It seems more interested in things like race, narcotics, a small clique of writers, the music, the accent of Jim Crow, a result of the Greenwich Village, super liberal, perhaps even quasi-communist. It calls it a creeping sickness. And says to bring back an all over USA approach and let's not to be so anti WASP Republican. Uh, goes on to say that to be white, Anglo Saxon, Protestant, Republican doesn't automatically mean bigot or hater, right? So, in many ways, what Gillespie is doing, right, kind of bringing these conversations to this world is it going to have a significant impact, right? Kind of engaging in an ideologically diverse uh, set of jazz fans. Let's give you kind of two quick examples of what this looked like as campaign stops and kind of how this worked, right, in terms of Gillespie using a celebrity to get these ideas out there. Uh, Gillespie, uh, you know, engages in his campaign at the September Monterey Jazz, September 1963 Monterey Jazz Festival. And we see a picture of uh, Gillespie, his campaign manager, uh, Gene Gleason, who is married to uh, San Francisco jazz critic Ralph Gleason, who's a big advocate of Gillespie's campaign sitting next to the Dizzy, uh, Dizzy for President banner. Again, 30,000 people are showing up to this festival, uh, giving Gillespie a large group of people to address with some of these ideas. Uh, the festival becomes transformed into a massive campaign rally. And I argue that this helps to expand the reach of the movement into these new social and cultural spaces that it may not have otherwise reached. And you see that reflect in the press coverage, right? Uh, that shows up in the jazz press at the conclusion of the festival. Ralph Gleason, again, uh, husband of the campaign manager, Gene Gleason, uh, Gillespie's campaign manager, described the launch of the uh, campaign as the climax of the festival itself, that its high point, Art Seidenbaum from the LA Times. The nomination is a joke, but the social consciousness behind it isn't, right? Talking about the importance and the value of Gillespie's ideas. Uh, Don D. Michael is the one that kind of names this Downbeat Magazine, the Dizzy Gillespie for President movement. And he got to republish some of the campaign lyrics. This is a really catchy campaign song that John Hendricks, uh, the lyricist in Gillespie's organization, comes up with and sings at the campaign or at the festival 
uh, to really kind of transform it to a massive campaign rally. There's one more on the opposite side of the coin that shows um, Gillespie confronting uh, individuals that might be opposed to the civil rights movement. This happens in the Midwestern Jazz Club uh, the next month in 1963 after uh, the Monterey Jazz Fest. And Gillespie would kind of stop between songs and share these ideas that I just discussed as part of his platform on the stage. Uh, and he's doing this in this club, this, this heckler interrupts and says, never mind that, just play. And Gillespie responds, you people have been telling us what to do long enough. That's all been changed now. They're doing that down in Birmingham, right? A direct reflection of the civil rights movement and activism taking place within Birmingham, Alabama, and bringing that into a jazz club within the Midwest. The heckler retorted, play your horn. That's what you're getting paid for. So at that point, the performance stops and the Gillespie goes into full campaign mode and gives a, a campaign speech for the rest of the performance. So that moment in time, this jazz club is transformed into a forum on the civil rights movement, all tied to the fact that Gillespie is playing the, the, uh, the role of the candidate. And I kind of end here uh, just with Gillespie kind of looking back on this experience, saying that's why I thought I would run for president to take advantage of voters uh, and publicity uh, that I received to promote change. It wasn't just a publicity stunt. I made, a, I made campaign speeches and I mobilized people. And here's a Gillespie, just kind of two shots of Gillespie uh, from his kind of time performing at jazz clubs, touring the country, taking this campaign and its ideas with him. And I'll kind of open it up to Q&A as we look at some images of campaign buttons uh, uh, that were produced by the Gillespie for President campaign. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaffney. I, yeah. I don't, I don't know how much time he had, but this is, I feel so uh, unaccomplished with my life <laughs> hearing what all these people are, what, what he's doing. Uh, so we have a couple um, questions in the Q&A. I don't know if it's preferable for you to read them because they're, um, they're pretty involved. Would you rather do that or would you like us to read it for you? No, I, I can read. Uh, the first time the opportunity to meet is Gillespie during high school. I, I had the incredible opportunity to meet Dizzy Gillespie during high school. I was part of a high school jazz band and he agreed to meet with some of the high school musicians. Little did I know of his activism as a social entrepreneur. Do you have any more comments on how uh, to more actively share uh, out these types of stories about Gillespie's incredible contributions that go well beyond the music? That's a great question. And I think that's that's one of the, hopefully one of the, the goals of the work that I've been doing uh, over the course of my career as an academic. I kind of started out just as a huge jazz fan and kind of recognizing that I'm not a, I'm a horrible musician, right? And the fact that uh, this music still means something to me uh, really talks about the ways in which, you know, non-musicians uh, play a role within the history of jazz and the fact that the music is going to touch other aspects of American life. I wish I could have had it handy, but what really got me in thinking about uh, the relationship between jazz and, and African-American political activism was an album by Max Roach uh, called We Insist Freedom Now Suite, which had the cover of uh, the, the famous kind of the image of the four students who initiated the sit-in movement in, uh, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina uh, to spark the student sit-in movement. Uh, so it just kind of made me wonder, you know, I, just, I never thought about jazz and it's it, the way it kind of spills out in other aspects and other avenues of American life. And here's this, this civil rights record, right? The civil rights image on the cover of this jazz album, it kind of blew me away and kind of took me down this rabbit hole. Uh, so hopefully, you know, as this kind of work gets out here, uh, that'll start to happen. Uh, but there are you know, historians that are kind of working on this as well. There's a really interesting book that was recently published uh, by Gerald Horn, uh, I guess maybe three years ago now, called Jazz and Justice, uh, looking at the political economy of jazz music. And he's kind of written in UJS history, but it's a labor history of jazz, right? It's about jazz musicians as workers. Uh, so there are other ways which you're going to find historians begin to think about, right, the role that individuals like Gillespie play within their within the scope of their their kind of careers, right? So not just musicians, but workers, uh, as civil rights activists, kind of so on and so forth. So it's slowly kind of getting out there. Hopefully, we just get some more momentum behind kind of sharing those stories. But it's a great question. Another question here. Uh, thanks so much for speaking about the personal uh, and the lynching of his friend and the political context that received failure of civil rights, civil rights liberalism, which Gillespie operated as social activist. Even today, uh, it is easy, easy to give up hope. Uh, what gave Gillespie the power to go on? Uh, do you know anything about his personality, his belief system that could shed light on his perseverance? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gillespie uh, had was a was a driven individual uh, and driven to accomplish uh, kind of anything is he really kind of set out for, right? And you see that very early on in his childhood with his effort to kind of master, if you will, the trumpet, right? His, his kind of core instrument. Uh, you see that within his determination, uh, you know, to begin to build an orchestra to kind of try and try again uh, with the effort to kind of form and kind of reform these orchestras. I kind of dive into this, but, you know, one of the challenges that Gillespie runs into uh, in kind of organizing these orchestras is that, you know, kind of big, the kind of modern jazz bebop uh, isn't as popular outside of New York as he'd like it to be. Uh, so he'd go, go into, you know, the South, people would hear the music, they kind of think it's kind of crazy, then he'd have problems getting kind of, his orchestra kind of getting rebooked in those venues. So he's kind of trying again. He's someone that never gives up, and he kind of recognizes that he runs to a roadblock. He works to come up with something new, right? He's one of the kind of pioneers of, of Latin jazz, Afro-Latin jazz, and he does that, right, as he begins to run into these roadblocks uh, trying to pursue, uh, you know, kind of accumulating wealth, right, through modern jazz. So he's a person that, that kind of has this perseverance. And I didn't have a chance to dive into this, but you, you kind of see this reflected, right, in the way he's thinking about this particular moment in time, and not just the disillusion with civil rights, civil rights liberalism, but the sense of urgency, right, that he has as well, right? You know, one of the ideas or slogans, you know, of the movement at this moment in time was, we insist freedom now, right? The idea of not having to wait, right, for something to happen or legislation to happen, the idea of this happening now. And Gillespie, uh, and every time he talked, he also and always expressed that sense of urgency. So I really kind of think that that really compelled him. And I think a lot of activists over the course of this period that they had come so far in the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education that if the movement had stalled, uh, there was a feeling that that it would just it would never pick up again, right? It would never kind of carry forward. So there was a sense of urgency, right, that really kind of drove that moment in time. I think it, that drove his activism in the context of this campaign and beyond. So Nick, it strikes me, and you and I have talked about this, but you know, in our education system. When they talk about the civil rights movement, it's all Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, March on Washington. Uh, they really downplay the economic nationalism, but essentially every civil rights movement, from the Black Panthers to Malcolm X to the SCLC, really all had an economic underpinning of, of how to increase that, how to increase entrepreneurship, how to increase workers. And, and just speak on that for a moment. I mean, because you're talking about now even, even the jazz and core. I mean, it was all about trying to do more economically, but we just don't hear that side of it. Yeah, there's it, it's an interesting kind of dynamic, right? That that's been glossed over. Just one of the kind of ways to highlight that significance is the fact that we talk about the March in Washington and people just kind of stop there, but it's the March in Washington for jobs and freedom. The jobs comes first, right? I mean, that is the, the one kind of unifying ethic that begins to wed African-American political activism uh, kind of post-Civil War, right, across time and ideological diversity, this focus on, on economic opportunity, right? You see the, well, you know, Booker T. Washington, to go back to the turn of the century or the beginning of the, of the 20th century, and the end of the ACP were at odds, right? They were both pursuing some form of economic program, right? Booker T. Washington from the standpoint of, uh, of labor, right? Uh, and we see from the standpoint of black professionals, we're talking about kind of economic engagement, right? You know, Marcus Garvey, to throw in the uh, black nationalist perspective from that moment in time, talking about kind of black and industrialization, right? Uh, building a, a shipping company. And you see that ethic carried through. Even when you look at uh, kind of more radical groups uh, like the Black Panther Party, who are kind of regarded to be kind of black Marxists, right? Uh, like, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, a socialist kind of perspective, when you really begin to look at their ideas and how they begin to describe uh, their vision uh, for economic self-determination, what they're really kind of looking at is, is a form of capitalism just under kind of African-American control, right? And building kind of Black economic institutions. But if you think about kind of how that would operate, once those institutions were built, they're going to be interacting in, in a broader uh, kind of capitalist economy that's that's diverse, right? We're just talking about what's going to anchor that from the same point of Black participation. So it is, I mean, the economic dimension is a unifying theme, and I think that's getting a lot more traction 
in more recent histories that are written about the movement, the idea to kind of remember that aspect. There been, there's been a really good book. Uh, there are two really good books to talk about this, one from the civil rights uh, front. Uh, there's another one called like The Business of Black Power, uh, a collection of essays that was put out a couple of years ago that begin to do this work. Just in the, the historiography, you're looking at the aspect of, kind of economic development and the aspect of money just became kind of unpopular uh, because of, and there's it's a longer kind of discussion, but just the, the nature of the way in which different modes of social movement theory had shaped the histories that are told about the movement. Uh, right now, uh, you see kind of civil, or historians kind of writing about the movement from the standpoint of uh, social movement theories uh, by a person, a scholar named Alden Morris, who talks about a model called the indigenous model, which talks about the idea that African Americans have the resource within their communities to engage in activism. Uh, another similar model to Morris is by Doug McAdam, called the political process model, that, but it privileges the fact that Black communities have the power to engage in protest by their own means. If you look at civil rights histories written before the, the kind of early 80s, they begin to focus on another model called the resource mobilization model. And the resource mobilization model talked about external resources being funneled into uh, kind of civil rights organizations, and really kind of talking about kind of white outside money coming in. And I think the shift, right, from that resource mobilization and the outside money to looking at the capacity of Black communities to engage in protests internally made the focus on money and economic development, right, as a key issue. It kind of obscured that as that became like the the kind of unpopular thing to do. So now you it's know, kind of yeah, coming back. Yeah. You know, Barra Doran in her book, The Color of Money, says that it's easier to get political rights than economic rights. That people will give you the right to vote before they'll actually give you the chance to make money and compete economically. You you sort of agree with that, or you think it's too simplified? Uh, no, I think it's I think it's it's that's definitely like a like a factor, right? And I think when you look at just the 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 ease in which you can go out and, and vote, right? Uh, even today, right, with with without rights being restricted, the ease there is to go register to vote, generally speaking. And the challenges of, of establishing a like a, an entrepreneurial endeavor, right? You know, just the the need to fill out a registration form um, relative to the need to be able to access and acquire capital, right? To establish a business, it's just a much higher uh, kind of threshold and a higher bar to be able to to achieve. And there's a lot more at stake, right? Uh, when you look at the way in which political kind of powers organize versus economic power, and I think that definitely that that paradigm that Baradarin is is talked about it definitely kind of rings true at least from my perspective well i'll say it really struck me with the comment you had of what happened in the midwestern jazz club when dizzy gillespie was told to just shut up and play man that reflects today <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're seeing that in the last two weeks of the lsu basketball team uh we're seeing it with what happened in tennessee last night the notion of you know uh, you know you can only protest in in certain ways and but, you know, the, the, the fact is, if people approve of it, it's really not a protest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Almost by definition, if people like what you're doing, it's not a protest. And so uh, those are the constraints on it. Well, we're running out of time, but uh, thank you so much for being with us today. I've learned a great deal. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Isan, Cornelia, if y'all need to say anything, but uh, Nate, we really appreciate it. So thank, thank you, you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. I really enjoy having a chance to kind of share and kind of engage the, the audience with the great questions and kind of share this research out. Uh, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity. It's been a fantastic audience. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And um, thank you, Keller Center, Princeton, for continuing to enthusiastically support and host this lecture series. Each semester, we have three lectures and a concluding roundtable. So our next one will, our next lecture will be April 24th at 1.30 Eastern, at p.m. Eastern, and the roundtable will be May 10th. So please register, attend live if you can, so your questions can be answered and uh, comments addressed. And finally, I'd like to remind you that these talks are recorded and can be found on the Keller Center website. So please watch them, share them. And again, thank you and take care everyone. All right, goodbye. Learn more about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States by visiting kellercenter.princeton.edu slash Black entrepreneurship.
Join us for future Keller Center events, which you can find at kellercenter.princeton.edu slash events.